Good Tuesday morning. I'm going to read you Matthew's Gospel. This one here for a clergy. This one here should be, I think, should be put on every wall of every seminary room and every monastery and all the rest. I really mean, I love this text, okay? Watch. Jesus spoke to the crowds and the disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have taken their seat on the chair of Moses. Therefore, have true legitimacy. Therefore, do and observe all things, whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. Listen to their authoritative teaching, but don't follow the example. For they preach, but they don't practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to carry, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they'll not lift a finger to move them. Boy, that struck me at the preaching and the pastoral ministries of the 50s when we were kids. We laid heavy burdens of conscience on people, but what did we do to lift them? We had more mortal sins than Cotter has liver pills. I mean, and I think the lawyers took over the church. You know what they saw of canon lawyers? I shouldn't tell you this. They called the revenge of the Pharisees on the church. <laughs> That's the truth. And I think of all of that. Maybe it was necessary at the time, but they burdened our consciences so heavily. Where was the love of Christ? in the preaching of the church. We have mortal sins. If you come in 20 minutes late for mass, it was a venial, but 25 minutes late, if you missed the, the offertory, I think it was, I forgot what part it was, it was a mortal sin. Think about a mortal sin. Think about that. Mortal sin means if you die in that state, you're gonna to go to hell for eternity. Now, who could take that seriously in the life of the church in 1950, after the Holocaust of 1939 to 45? How do you say somebody's going to go to hell for missing Mass or being late for Mass when you have just seen the witness of horror, uh, the 10th century of horror, the first century of horror, where you really see evil? How can you take seriously that? Or, I, this was a good one too, you, could, you couldn't eat meat on Friday. Well, you could, but you've got to keep it under two ounces. What hypocrisy. You know, we all believed all that. How could we have believed it seriously? How could the church have preached it? God Almighty, how could they have preached it in the light of the 20th century when you really saw evil? I mean, evil beyond imagination. 80 million people were killed in the Second World War. Most of them were women, children, innocents, non-combatants. How about the death camps? 10 million people were gassed by the Nazis. 10 million, that's a mortal sin, literally and figuratively. Huh? Are you worried about meat on Friday? I remember one time yelling at my old man because he was eating a piece of meat. He said, well, don't be a fanatic. He was right, he was right, he was right. That's not religion, that's fanaticism. How do you shape a conscience like that when in light of all the horrors that are real evils in the world? I'm just beefing right now, but you know what? I'm not wrong. And where was our efforts to lift human burdens, not place them? I learned that in the monastery. It was a great revelation for me. They taught us how to be confessors. And what they taught us was to lift men's burdens, lift people's burdens, don't play. Why? We were contemplating the cross of Christ. Christ came to save us, not dump on us. And the compassion of Christ is the crucified Christ. And so I know I, my entire priest or whatever it's worth, and I'm just one little local yokel compared to I mean, thinking of just a passionist among others. I know when I went in and hear a confession, my whole, my whole thing is to lift your burdens. I'm not going to add weight to it. I'll offer guidance if you ask for it. But at the same time, I'm going to lift those burdens if i got to get underneath it and pick it up. Sometimes you find that people says, no, I'm a guilty guy. And, you know, give me a penance. Okay, okay, okay. I'll give you what you want, but I'm not going to add to the burden. I ain't doing it. Get somebody else to do it. I'm not doing it. I was called to lift your burdens, not add. I'm not doing it. And that's the truth. We are servants. We are in this. We are service of humanity to lift the burdens, to bring enlightenment. And the church is here to enlighten and to lift men's burden, people's burdens, not to increase them. We're here to free you from the burdens of life not to add to them. Boy, I mean that, God, you have no idea. Then this, this part gets me, kind of gave me a kick in a way. He says, he's talking about 
He's talking about the Pharisees at that time. He said, and the Sadducees. He said, all their works are performed to be seen. Boy, I think of some of that. They widen their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. Think of the vestments. Some of the most flamboyant vestments. Holy Christmas. I saw that with some liturgists. Holy cow, come on, give it a rest. It looked like a circus, okay? They love places of honor at banquets, seats of honor in the synagogues. No, that's the clergy. That's me too. I mean, I've been, whether I loved it or not, we got those places. Greeting in the marketplace. Salutations, rabbi. Hey, what do we hear, Father? You see? As for you, don't be called a rabbi. We, you, uh, you have but one teacher, and you're all brothers and sisters, okay? Call no one on earth your father. You've been, you have but one father in heaven. And look at that. We've been called father this, father that for a thousand years, 1,500 years. No, you wonder, did they ever read these things? Did they ever read the gospel? I wonder, doesn't it? They never think about this. The gospel is saying, don't call anybody your father. You've got one father in heaven, right? Yeah. Do not call, be called master. You have built, built one master, the Christ. So I'm a, I do, I'm called father, and in a sense, I have an, two MAs, so that's a master's. Oh, well. The greatest, this is the important line. The greatest among you must be your servant. And whoever calls himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It's called servant leadership. It's called servant leadership. We are called to be servants of each other, not masters. We don't wear the instruments of power. We should wear... We should wear the, uh, the, the clothes of the servant, the simple life of the servant. One thing I saw that in my, my, my community, passion, is our habit is a beautiful habit, one of the most beautiful, but it is also simple. It's beautiful with the sign, the leather belt, the rosaries. But when you really wore it with sandals, it was not flamboyant at all. It was humble understatement. That's the truth. It's a beautiful habit. It doesn't suggest power, but the humility of a crucified Christ. The sign says, Jesu Cripacio, the passion of Christ, may it always be in my heart. That's why it's, the sign has the symbol of the cross and the heart. Jesu Cripacio, Christ. I see. Yeah. See, that's something, huh? Yeah. May the passion of Christ be always in our hearts. Jesu Cripacio, the passion of Jesus Christ. We are called to the servitude to the service. We are called to servants, service to the church. Not lording, not flamboyance, nothing. I think one of the things that happened in history, I'm just thinking about that in the Mass this morning at church, and that is the church be at the time of the Roman Empire, when it became Romanized, it imitated not the crucified Christ, but the emperor. So the hierarchy became, the church became hierarchical with the Roman Empire. Papacy became, in a sense, the new imperium, the new, the new emperor, as it were, imitating that structure. And bishops and priesthood as a hierarchical structure. It doesn't look like a servant. It doesn't act like a servant. It looks like a power base, a triangular power base. And the ultimate power is at the top of the triangle. And the laity at the bottom. So, in a sense, it's as if the bottom serves the top instead of the top serving the bottom. I think the Second Vatican Council did a lot to reverse that. We are called to serve in leadership. When John, John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd said he was the Pope, as Pope he said he was the servant of the servant, service of Andy Day. He serves the servants of God, service of Andy Day. That should be the whole life of the church. We are servants of, the, servants of all the servants. And ultimately we serve Christ, the body of Christ, the world. We're called to serve, not rule over, not lord it, but to serve. I believe that. I believe it. But you see in a text like Matthew, he's already seeing the problem. Okay? That's the truth. Seen? Yes. Anyway, <laughs> I can't help but think of the, uh, the, glor the glamorous role of the church of the 50s and 40s, the hierarchical structure and all the rest. How, in a sense... It served it, I assume, but in the end, I think it betrayed the ultimate foundational element of the gospel. We are called to serve, to be servants of the servants. We're not here to be aristocrats. <laughs>